Can you hear me okay? Yeah? <coughs> All right. Okay. okay, let's get started. Uh, so, first of all, I, I want to thank you for uh, staying late and attending this last session. I know you guys are all waiting for beer and going out to Amsterdam to party. So, you know, you can do that in about an hour. Until then, we're going to talk to you about our work. Um, so, before we start, just a quick word about us. So, uh, I'm Julian. I've been a, a VP engineer and CTO in web startups for the last 10 years. Um, I have to be fully honest, I left Viadeo two weeks ago, and I am now working for AWS. But fear not, this is definitely not <laughs> a sales pitch. This is about the work we've done at Viadeo and nothing else. Um, Antoine? Uh, so my name is Antoine Guy, and uh, I worked in uh, web infrastructure and operation for more than 14 years already. And uh, I'm still working at Viadeo, so I have many things to say <laughs> on AWS that won't be a sales pitch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. At least one of us is going to be honest. Huh? <laughs> All right. You can beat me up at the end if you want. OK, so what, this, uh, w what is this thing about? So we're going to start way, way back uh, and discuss uh, uh, the rationale. Why did we even end up picking AWS for our migration? We'll look at some of the design options and trade-offs that we, that we had to consider. Uh, we'll also discuss about the parts of the stack, the technology stack that were altered to go in AWS or not. And uh, Antoine will give you a lot of great technical details on the complete automation of our infrastructure build using a technology called CloudFormation and continuous integration. So. What's the starting point? Well, the starting point is our technology stack. Um, we were a, a large website, and uh, uh, everything relies on a service platform uh, that is called Casper. It's our internal code name for it. Uh, it's written with Java and Spring and everything you'd consider. It's, it's pretty modern. It's using some nice uh, architecture patterns that I listed there, CQRS, etc. So, you know, pretty nice service platform. On top of that, we're running a web application that we call Limbo, uh, that is written in Node.js with all those fancy uh, JavaScript packages. Uh, uh, mobile is super important to, to us. Uh, we're running mobile apps on iOS, Android, for all of the different device <coughs> devices, sorry. And, of course, you know, we love backends. We have so many of them uh, for legacy reasons and you know, some different use cases as well. So MySQL, Elasticsearch for member indexes kind of thing, um, HBase, Spark, Hadoop, probably a few more I didn't even find out about. Uh, infrastructure, so ha, that's the funny part. Uh, so we have about 250 physical servers. That's 15 racks or so. And of all places, they're hosted in San Francisco, California. Did we mention we're a French company and we do most <laughs> of our business in France and we have 10 million users in France, right? You don't want to know why. But, you know, we have a nice data center sitting downtown San Francisco. And as you will see, you know, that was one of the reasons why we decided to do something else. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you guys here are... Uh, one way or another, you're running infrastructure, and you know, as soon as you power up servers, you know, you start to have some problems. And well, so did we. So let's look at some of the challenges that we had. The first one is obvious, and I, it's it's a bit sad, but pr probably some of you have that problem too. Our servers are getting old. S most of them are not supported anymore, right? So you have these servers, and they start to fail, and they start to get slow. And, and you start to get frustrated about performance and, and service quality. So definitely something we want to address. The second one uh, has been talked to death <laughs> in these last three days. You know, it's about agility. And uh, the Viadeo team, the Viadeo tech team, uh, has adopted pretty modern agile practices over the last two, three years 
you know, feature teams, etc. So all, all the latest stuff has been in place for a while. It's running fine uh, from design to coding, etc. Unfortunately, we can't say the same thing about infrastructure. So we have very strong agility for dev and a lot of rigidity for infrastructure. And that's a typical situation uh, in many companies. So something we want to fix. Number three, operating a physical network. So nothing specially wrong about that, except we definitely don't want to do it. You know, it's not key to our business. And uh, sure, we can run Cisco stuff and, and you know, firewalls, etc. But just, you know, we don't want to do it. We don't care. Operating a remote data center, that one's, that's one pretty bad. You know, we're uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers away from our servers. Uh, you can imagine, you know, that creates a lot of interesting issues. And, uh, you know, again, we don't want to, we, we want to get out of that. And my favorite, everyone's favorite actually, is disaster recovery, especially when your data center is likely to fall off in the ocean at any, any given minute. Um, it will, you know, uh, it will. So what's our plan for that, you know? And so, yes, we do have a disaster recovery plan, but it's not super, super strong. And whenever the big one hits San Francisco and, and the racks actually fall into the ocean, uh, it's probably going to take us one day or two days to be back in a different location. And, well, I think that's way too long for a web company, right? And, and my boss did too, so we agreed on that one. So faced with this, you know, we're, we sat down and we tried to come up with options. And actually, uh, we had four options. So there's a lot of information in there. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it completely. I'm just going to point to the obvious ones, important ones. So on the left, we could upgrade the servers, right? We could buy some more servers and replace the old ones. And, you know, everyone knows how to do that. That would only solve the, you know, the, the uh, hardware issue. That would solve none of the other issues. Um, and that could cost a lot of money because you have to pay up front for that physical infrastructure. And our gut feeling on that one was bad. I mean, you know, we've been doing this for 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, let's, it's time, you know, we did something else, right? So, no, we don't want to do this. It's not solving much. Uh, another option we looked at was full virtualization and consolidation of, of those 15 racks into maybe two, three racks. So, yes, solves the hardware issue, improves agility, doesn't solve anything else, still costs a lot of money, and gut feeling, you know, well, yeah, cool option, three to five years ago, right? Now it's probably too late to do that. Number three option was, hey, let's build a new data center with modern technology in a very safe place. So solves hard, the hardware issue, improves disaster recovery, costs even more money, takes you know, a lot of time, and to be honest, just a waste, a huge waste of time and money because we don't need to do that. And the last option we looked at was, can we go to a public cloud? And you know, our feeling was, yeah, it's going to solve or improve a lot of our issues. Uh, but hey, this looks like a massive project. And uh, do we have a lot of uh, cloud experts in the team? Uh, nope. So we knew this was going to hurt a little bit. And it did hurt quite a lot. But let's be honest, you know, we're all engineers. And this was the solution that put a smile on everyone's face, even though we knew it was going to hurt. And so this is the one we picked. So why, besides, you know, being crazy engineers? Well, the number one thing is, in a company like ours, you want to focus on <coughs> building a great service. This is your number one responsibility, right? This is your core business. So dealing with, you know, hardware issues, licensing issues, supplier issues drives you nuts. And it's a huge waste of time. So we didn't want to do this ever. Um, and obviously, you know, 
as a web company, we want to experiment, we want to A-B test, we want to try out a, a lot of IDs and without any constraint and without waiting for weeks for servers to show up. And so, you know, a few clicks away, you can build your clusters, you can start your instances and you can try things out. If it doesn't work, just terminate everything and you wasted, you know, $5.78 or something. Well, as you can see, and as I already mentioned, we were just ready for it. I mean, our, our, our tech culture of agility and DevOps uh, is very strong. And there was no resistance. There was no resistance to change. You know, everybody was, was like, yeah, let's fucking do it. You know, we can't wait to start. Um, unlike physical infrastructure, cloud services will allow you to measure very precisely what part of the infrastructure is costing what. And so you put that new project in production, you can pretty much see what's, what instances, how much storage, et cetera, are assigned to that project. So you can know exactly how much it is costing and, you know, is the ROI okay or is this, again, a waste? Uh, so that's something that was pretty interesting to us. And the last point, you know, uh, it's kind of a, an obvious thing as well. Uh, actually, we had already been using uh, public clouds for, for a while for some services, some, you know, backups and archives and cold storage and stuff like that. So that didn't make us any experts. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we knew this was agile and easy and, and yeah, you know, we had uh, some confidence it would work. And so the next logical step was, okay, now that we're ready to jump, which one, are, which one of those clouds are we going to use? And, you know, as we already said 10 times, we picked AWS. So as I just mentioned, we were already using some services. So it kind of made sense to uh, continue doing that. But, you know, that's a pretty weak reason. Um, probably the, m the most important one was um, being able to access past technology, uh, pretty cool past technology in a few clicks. You know, we, we tried a few services, we saw how fast we could deliver clusters in different parts of our infrastructure, and that made a whole lot of sense to us, you know. Mul being multi-region was nice. Uh, you know, we have infrastructure in the US, we could probably want, you know, uh, we could probably decide to leave some stuff in the US, but maybe we want something in Europe, maybe we want something in different parts of the world. And that, you know, that made a lot of sense too. And, and you know, AWS is moving super fast, uh, new features all the time, new improvements all the time, and, and def definitely a very lively uh, uh, platform that, you know, looked very appealing to us. And we started the project, you know, in January, and actually about five months later, uh, Gartner, you know, I usually don't show that stuff because, you know, Gartner is about marketing, but hey, uh, every once in a while, uh, they, they released a, a report on cloud infrastructure, and it's a bit small, so you guys in the back, maybe you don't, you don't see so, so, so well, but in the top right corner, that's AWS, right? And so, and, you know, I'm not going to name the others, more power to them, but we were like, okay, you know, at least some other people think this is the way to go. And, uh, and you know, take a look at that report. It's, it's pretty interesting to see the strength and the weaknesses of each platform. And so off we go. And so we're all excited. We're all crazy about this. And uh, uh, we, we thought it would be important to have some rules, some guidelines to keep us on track. So the key objectives were and are automation, scalability, and safety, right? Automation is obvious. We're, it's not a big team. We need to, to be as efficient as possible. Scalability, because we want to use exactly the resources we need. Safety, because it's automated. It could go really wrong really fast. We want to have continuous integration and delivery on everything, including our infrastructure, which is kind of a new concept. You know, you can actually test and deploy your infrastructure. So that's pretty cool. 
uh, will only replace parts of the stack if the benefits are too good to pass. You know, we're not going crazy with replacing everything. We're going all in, so the end, at the end, we should be able to close the data center. But you know, we're not doing this over a weekend and, and you know, <laughs> no big bang kind of thing. So it's a gradual move, and, uh, and we're ready to roll back if things go really wrong. And so that means we have to plan for uh, a temporary hybrid run with both our data center and our, uh, our you know, growing AWS deployment. So these were the rules that we have in mind, and that should keep us on the road. And now I will uh, pass the mic to Antoine, uh, who's going to uh, give you more technical details about how we did it. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Julian. Um, now that Julian gave us some context about the situation, uh, I'm going to try to explain you the way we followed to conduct this transformation. So first, we did a sorted store state of our infrastructure. We make sure we listed every server, every service, every network equipment, every VPN connection, whatever, everything. And the goal of this state was to have an estimate of what it will cost to move everything as is in the cloud. And to know each services, what it will cost, if it's possible or not. And um, the, the, the good thing when you do this is that if you know the cost of each services, you can also evaluate if it makes sense to replace it with a SaaS solution, for example. And uh, if, you, if you see some services that, for example, uh, are, doesn't make sense to move into the cloud. So you have to do this. It's a, it's a thorough study of your infrastructure. Sometimes you find uh, uh, what we call our pain point. Um, it can be, like for example, technical debt, like this server or this service that nobody knows but it's still running. Uh, or maybe it's this legacy app that nobody wants to touch. And we discovered something that uh, we, uh, we will have to deal with. And then you have to define a plan, an Ilven plan, because you want to know where to start. Uh, you have to define it. Uh, of course, you won't follow it, but let's do it. Uh, what we found out is that most of the companies that do this, like move all into the cloud, are following uh, kind of the same way. Usually they start with dev and staging envir environment because there is no risk and it's easy to do and you can gain some experience on it. Uh, then analytics, because uh, analytics, again, there is no risk and there is some nice feature in the cloud solution to, for analytics. Then you start with your legacy application, your critical application, and then if everything went well, you close your data center. So we started like this, and of course, uh, there were unexpected uh, diversions. Uh, for example, uh, emergencies, like you need some capacity and you're not going to expand your data center because you plan to close it, so you just go right into the cloud. Or Sometimes new project comes during the way, and you don't want to start it in the legacy infrastructure. It doesn't make sense, so you go directly into the cloud. Or sometimes we add early adopters, teams that want to move. They can. They're ready. So you just have to help them, and you're not going to say no to them. So that's what we started to do anyway. So keeping in mind the key objectives that Julian gave us before, one of the logical things to do and one of the great advantage to move into the cloud is to use infrastructure as code. So with infrastructure as code, your infrastructure is just, is just code. So it can be version. You can track changes. You can review changes. You can test it. You can deploy it automatically. It's really nice features that all the developers have been using and experimenting for many years now. So it makes sense to, 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 to move into the same direction. So, 
Um, one of the big advantages is also if you do it correctly, your infrastructure is just code, and if you can deploy it in a region, you can also deploy it in another region in just in a matter of a few hours or even minutes. So if your RTO is not so strict, uh, you can even think of the cloud as its own disaster recovery. So Julian said we went with AWS, and uh, in AWS, the infrastructure as code product is called CloudFormation. Um, CloudFormation is a JSON-based descriptive language that uh, allow you to create every kind of resources you can find in AWS. Would it be instances, database, storage, security rules, everything. And it also takes care of relationships, dependencies, uh, order of creation. And the nice thing, of course, it's with CloudFormation, you can test the validity of what you've write, of what you've worked before deploying it. Uh, so we went with CloudFormation. Uh, there is other solution that we considered uh, when we started. Uh, some of them gained a lot of traction lately, like Terraform from uh, Hashimoto or Ansible. And I'm sure there is many others. But the thing is, you just need to choo choose one, the one you, you, you want. Uh, as some guys from Mozilla um, told this morning, um, there is some disadvantage for each, but the nice thing in CloudFormation is you stay close to the provider, and there is no overhead, there is no uh, missing APIs, there is no mm. issues that you have to deal with with a third party. So basically, infrastructure as code is going from that to this. <laughs> and uh, if any of you spend some time in a data center, uh, you have to agree that it's a very welcome evolution. <laughs> um, so after a few weeks of playing, writing JSON, experimenting and everything, we end up with uh, something like, look like this. It's, uh, it's not very fancy, it's uh, just a VPC, which is a virtual private cloud, basically your own network in, uh, in AWS with um, different subnet, private subnet, public subnet, which is kind of a VLAN. Uh, and that's it. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's one of the diagram for the AWS documentation. It's not, not really difficult to do. But it does a job. It's scalable. It's highly available. And I think you, should de you could deploy it in a few minutes. So I'm going to explain uh, how we how we automate all of this. Uh, first, you wrote some templates. You wrote some CloudFormation files. So you need to test them before deploying them. Um, there is a CLI uh, provided by Amazon. You can do AWS CloudFormation validate template. It's really easy. You know at least that it will play without errors. You don't know if the result will be what we want, but it will play. Then you can write some test case uh, with the uh, Language of choice. Uh, AWS provides many SDK. They they publish the Go SDK lately. If you want, uh, at Viadeo we did it with Ruby and uh, Rec, and and we did in Rec we did everything we need to test the file we were uh, we are writing, and to push them uh, on production once they were tested. Uh, you put everything in Git, like you would do for any development, uh, and you link Git with any CI tools. We use SQL CI, but we use also Jenkins. Choose whatever you want. It's all the same concept. Um, every change in Git will trigger um, uh, the CI tools, which will validate the file, run the test that you want to run, and then if you want, you can even push the change and deploy it to your staging environment or your test environment or your any, anything. So that's it. You have continuously deployed infrastructure. It's not really difficult. Um, 
Then on this infrastructure, you need to run instances. Uh, instances uh, in a cloud run on machine, machine image. And um, if you use a configuration management, like Puppet, Chef, or whatever, um, you can, from your configura configuration management, automate the baking of machine image. Um, there are some tools like uh, Packer from Hashimoto again and uh, Aminator from Netflix that can take care of this for you. And it's all CLI and APIs and whatever, so you can just put it in a CI tools again. So basically, you can just CI the creation of your machine image for every change in your config management you will create a new image. And if you're using the role pattern in your config management, which is more and more common in Puppet and in Chef, and I don't know the others, uh, you can write, we can create an image for each role that you can then deploy in each environment, which is really convenient. Um, then if you do this, you will soon ask yourself, should I completely bake my image uh, with every change, every new version, every release, and do a new image each time? Or should I just do a base image and then let the configuration management do the rest? So we tried to take a decision, and it turns out there's no truth. Uh, for example, for auto-scaling service, a completely baked image uh, is the way to go because you want instances starting and be ready as quickly as possible. So you want the machine image to be completely done. For some services which are, which are not so critical or, or don't change so often, um, you can just make a half-baked image or just a base image and let the configuration management do the rest. So we took step one and two, mix everything, and that's what we built. Um, so we have two Git repository, one for the config management and one for the infrastructure. Um, from the configuration management repository, we build the machine image. And from the infrastructure repository, we build crude formation template that we push in S3. And then the only thing left to do is trigger deploy of the, of the infrastructure code using the machine image, and that's it you have your service up and running. And if you do this for all your service, you have your data center up and running and ready. So along the way, uh, no. Actually, CloudFormation can be a little bit intimidating if you want to start from scratch, because you don't know the language. And you don't know what it looks like. Uh, and, and if you don't know AWS, it's even harder. Uh, it turns out AWS provided tools called, called CloudFormer. It's a tool that uh, can decode your existing resources in AWS that you created through the uh, user interface and can uh, it outputs CloudFormation files with all the JSON of the resource that exists. Uh, the file it creates are not really usable, but it's a good starting point if you want to learn how to write the JSON of what you want in your infrastructure. Um, when we create templates of CloudFormation, um, you want to make sure they are easy to reuse because you want, it's like code. You don't want duplicate, duplication of code. So there is a concept in CloudFormation which is called nested stack. It's basically calling a stack from within a stack. And uh, you can do this with uh, the depths you want. Uh, it's really useful, but it's also kind of dangerous because when you push some change with cloud formation, sometimes a stack can be stuck in a uh, undefined state. And, and you cannot make change anymore to these stacks. And uh, the only thing you can do is call support for help. So it's not a really nice situation for production environment. But so what we recommend is don't do nest attack of more than one level. And you could be tempted to do all your infrastructure in just one cloud formation file that will call every, every different stacks. Don't do it. Um, 
Another nice thing with CloudFormation is you can use it to perform green blue deployment. So say you have a service of running with a stack, you can just deploy the exact same thing with a little change, move traffic from green stack to blue stacks, and uh, if it doesn't work, just roll back. If it works, just stay like this, destroy the old stack, and you're done. Really useful. Another nice thing with CloudFormation is you can tag everything within CloudFormation. And since you reuse code and you use templates, you can tag everything very consistently and everywhere. Uh, we'll see later, tagging is very important. So after a few months, there is many things that we learned, uh, many things that we wanted to share with you. Uh, I'm not sure I will have enough time to go through every single of them, but um, first, network. Uh, Network is, in AWS, is very convenient. It's virtual. Um, you, can everything, you can do everything with code, as I said, but it's still network. And every resource will, dip, will depend on the network. So you have to plan it early, carefully. Um, if you're going to run a hybrid, like we said, you will need good connectivity with your data center. And this is your last link to the real world. And again, you have to plan it really early. Um, Load balancers. Load balancers in uh, AWS are called ELB. Uh, if, like us, you're used to big hardware box of level 7 load balancer, you will have a surprise. It's only level 3. There's not so many options. So you will have to adapt. Uh, CloudFront. Um, when you're in AWS it, and you're using a CDN, it makes sense to use CloudFront because it's the product from AWS. But um, in some cases, performance is not so great. So test yourself. There was a really great talk yesterday from Fastly on how to test CDN. Do it. Maybe it will be good for you. Maybe not. And anyway, if you want peace of mind and security, you should have anywhere a second CDN. Uh, CloudFront, like any other CDN, can fail. They did. And you don't want to be left in the black. Uh, more thing we learned, uh, EMR, Elastic MapReduce, is a kind of Hadoop on demand. And if, like us, we, you, 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 you have a live Hadoop cluster on premise, uh, which is always on, and you can start the job like you want, EMR is kind of the same, but not really. The concept between, be, be behind EMR is that you start a cluster, run the job, and then destroy the cluster. So the data is not always available. The data with EMR is in S3. You have to fetch the data and then put your result in S3. So you will have to adapt the way you work. Uh, MySQL, we are big users. We are big users of, of MySQL. So when we saw the advantages of LDS, we thought, great, we're going to move everything in LDS. It has really great advantage in uh, operation like replica management, snapshot, everything. It's great. So, except if you have still MySQL table like we do, uh, it's not for you, sorry. <laughs> um, limits. Uh, in AWS, every resource you can create have a number of, uh, you can create have limits. You cannot create more than 10, 100, whatever. Uh, it's only soft limit. So you have to ask for support. They will usually write them. It takes like between 15 minutes and one day. They will write them, but um, if you're going on production, you have to make sure that you write them in advance. And if you're going to use disaster recovery in another region, you have to make sure that the limits are the same in region A and region B, because your disaster recovery may not run in the other region if your limits are too low. Um, then if you're going to use autoscale, uh, you have to keep in mind that instances machine can be destroyed and created dynamically. So forget everything that you were doing with static name or static addressing. You will have to use a service discovery like console or ATCD. Uh, we personally went with console, but both are great and they work well with AWS. And finally, make sure everything is multi-AZ because 
it will be, it will be, it, I, I mean, you have to, to, to do something highly available, so multi as is a way to go in AWS. So that's it for me. There is many considerations that Julian will talk about now. Thank you. So actually, uh, tech is half the work. Um, it's a big project. It's going to impact the whole company. You know? So you have to talk to you know, the CEO, the CFO, let them know what you're doing, make sure that you have buy-in from these guys, uh, and make sure you understand their objectives. You know, maybe the CFO wants to cut infrastructure cost by you know, 50%. Maybe that's a problem for your project. You know? So you need to still understand what they want from that project. Uh, my advice is in any way, in any case, you need to involve legal and finance very early on, you know, because their time scale is not your time scale. Uh, one example is, you know, budgeting. Uh, you need to make sure they know you're going to spend maybe a little money in AWS and in the data center at the same time. So there's overlap. And of course, at some point, you'll want to, re to leave uh, your uh, physical infrastructure world. So you need to cancel some of your legacy contracts and there, there will be blood, okay? There is blood, uh, there's gonna be more blood. Uh, you know, hosting companies are not thrilled by this kind of project. So they, they're not helping you getting out. You have to be aware of that. And so you will need a good lawyer. <clears throat> when you start your project, you need to build an A team. You need to have dev, ops, architects, security to make sure you address all of the potential issues that you're gonna face. It's not just an ops topic or a dev topic. It's, you know, you need multiple guys in the team with different expertise. And of course, as you go, you need to raise awareness in the tech team and you need to transfer knowledge. You know, you don't wanna say, hey, we're in AWS and everything has changed to your uh, 60 developers. So as you go, you have to train them and show them, you know, uh, how to do things. So current status. So sta staging is fully done and running at AWS. And uh, actually, that was the initial plan. So we did at least follow that part. Uh, the part we didn't follow is actually we're already live. Uh, so we're serving production traffic from AWS already. That wasn't really the plan. We thought we would move the backends first and then the web servers. We did exactly the, you know, the contrary, but hey, that's life. Uh, we're running in three regions. We have multiple interconnected VPCs in those regions. We have over 100 instances for production and testing. So that's less than the actual number of servers. <coughs> so let's see if we can have, have less instances than servers in the end. And we're big fans of Redshift, the data warehouse solution, and we have two clusters for that. So what are the next steps? Next steps are, well, actually do what we thought we would do first, <laughs> moving the, the back ends. Uh, so as Antoine said, you know, find a, an efficient way to replace our live Hadoop cluster with EMR. Uh, we need to clean up some of the old MySQL stuff to get it ready uh, to move to RDS. There's a little bit of work there. Uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, will remain in EC2. Uh, AWS announced an Elasticsearch uh, managed service a few weeks ago, but you know, uh, it, it's not for, for Viadeo right now. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll still uh, use our old, uh, our old uh, clusters. And uh, of course, as we go, we're going to optimize technically and financially, maybe use reserved instances, spot instances, uh, auto scale, etc. So lots of cool things to do. Conclusion, well, let's be honest. Five years ago, if you had asked us, uh, any of us, um, if we were keen on using cloud computing, we would have said, no, no way. No fucking way, actually, I would have said. <laughs> no way, never. Now, if you, you know, if you ask us the same questions, uh, and when we ask that question to people out there, and, and they say, no, we don't, we, you know, we say, why? You know, why don't you use it? And you know, they will give us some reasons. Some of them are good. A few are good, actually. Uh, but m most of them are just wrong or outdated. 
So you know, there's a lot of catching up to do on what cloud computing can do for you. And you know, we, we still get accused of, ah, it's a fashion, you're following the trend, and blah, 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 blah. And I don't think that's a fashion, really. I mean, to me, the cloud is infrastructure in digital form, just like photos and movies. And you know, if cloud computing is a fashion, then maybe MP3 is a fashion as well. Who knows? And you know, we're making the most of it. Uh, we, we jumped into it, and it, it creates a lot of great engineering challenges. So, you know, we, we're not faced with physical infrastructure anymore, uh, but there's still a lot of very cool and very interesting work to do for, for us engineers. So we're quite happy about that. And this concludes my, our talk. And again, I want to thank all of you, each and every one of you, for staying up late, not starting to drink beers at uh, 5.30. 546 and you can do that now and uh, if you have any questions you know we'd be happy to answer them so thank you very much have a great weekend <laughs>